Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is the 31st of January question and answer session. We'll be talking about week three of the ENM 2020 course. Uh, <clears throat> so far, we've got three of us online with, with Andrea and Enrique and me. Um, I'm going to share my screen quickly just to be able to uh, to show you where we stand in the course uh, schedule. And essentially where we are is, there's the first week, second week. Here's where we are in the third week. You can see we're into the, the application section and we're gonna talk about climate change, reconstructing past distributions, and invasive species applications. We can talk more broadly, but what I'll suggest to the other instructors is that we try to answer just questions about the topics of this week. Um, but again, we can answer questions more broadly if we think that they're relevant. Um, and the other thing is to the other instructors, if there is a reprint that you think would make the questions and answers uh, more clear or that people in the course might wish to read, just send it to me, ideally while we are talking, and that way I will include it in a, in a packet to be posted. So um, Andrea and Enrique, thanks for joining. Uh, welcome. And you Thank you, Tom, hello. You want. Andrea is mute. Andrea, are you out there? Okay, now she's yeah. talking. Oh, I see yeah. I, I, I have no you can camera. turn on your Hi. camera if you want, Andrea. Hi, Tom. This is Sarah and me. I am with Sarah. Sarah also. Hi. Yeah, we have Good. no camera right now, but, but we will try to put it. Okay, well, there are here. two ladies in Brazil joining us, everybody. Um, <laughs> Okay, so let's jump into the questions. And essentially what we'll do is we can just kind of jump through the questions. Uh, instructors, any question that you want me to jump to, just tell me the line it's on and I will jump to it. Uh, if you like, I can start with, here's something from from Corey, uh, God, I wish I could get this out of my way. Let's see, okay, there we go. So there was a, a question that Corey wanted to respond to. Um, I don't know why the question was about uh, Martinez Mayer. Looks like we lost the Brazilian ladies. Uh -huh. um, but the question was, Maybe Corey's, there it is. Um, is currently ENM a tool that brings us the information enough so that we can speak about a climatic or environmental species? And that's an odd question. Yeah. Um, what is here's Corey's what is response. She, oh, there, there's Andrea and Sarah. Hi, hi there. Hi. hi. Um, Corey wanted to respond, but she's unable to be with us. So she said, we define species in the fossil record philosophically the same way that it is done with living species, which is to say an evolutionary lineage that's distinct from other lineages. However, in practical terms, we define species in the fossil record by morphology, whereas for, I'm paraphrasing, for living species, we have tools from both morphology and genetics and behavior and uh, everything else. Once a species definition is applied, we characterize the abiotic niche of the species using niche modeling. This, characteristic, this characterization is a hypothesis which we use to test questions about distributional changes uh, under varying geographic or temporal conditions. Defining a species by its niche is one way that scientists use to think about species definition, and she mentions the ecological species concept, 
But this has been shown to, be, to result in species groups that are lower resolution, they include more things, than morphology or genetically based phylogenetic definitions. In any event, you would not want to use ENM to define a species and then also use it to test hypotheses of distributional change because that gets a little circular. However, you could use various ENM tools to characterize niches of many species that you hypothesize to be functionally similar and test that hypothesis. So I think that's a nice answer from Corey. Um, basically, if you use the thing you're interested in studying to define the elements that you're studying, then you can no longer study the phenomenon that you wanted to study. So um, I think we're much better to use morphological species concepts in the fossil record um, and use those to ask good, smart evolutionary questions about the fossil record. Anybody else have a question that you want to take on? Well, there are many regarding climate change and... Uh, Tell me what one, line you want me to go to. Uh, I think there are several uh, regarding what makes a good uh, candidate species for uh, projecting models in climate change scenarios. It's because in, in, in my talk, I said that not all species are good candidates for, for projecting models. And uh, this is because it's a very common practice. And I would say that uh, it's, it's now a problem. But most people just get data from any sources, uh, occurrence data, and download some scenarios and just they get everything into into the modeling uh, system and they get maps from the present and the future and and that's it they people think that they are um, uh, doing a serious climate change analysis and uh, my whole point is that that shouldn't be the way we approach climate change because climate change is is not only to, to look at the patterns that, or the distributional patterns that, that these uh, tools allow to, to do, but we have to think on the whole process of how climate change really affects species. To, to be very clear with, with this question of what species make, uh, is a good candidate for, for um, making models through, through time, it's basically that we have to be very careful in how we calibrate a model in the, in the present time. If we cannot make a, a robust model for the present time, it doesn't make any, any sense to project it to a different uh, climate change scenario because the problems that we see in the present, for example, overestimating the, the the potential distribution or underestimating it, that will be much more exacerbated in, in, in the alternative scenarios. So we have the very rigorous in terms of, of how we calibrate uh, our model in the present time. I'll throw in um, a paper that, that was led by Aaron Saup that uh, the, the Kansas group published in 2012. I'll put that on the on the um, in a package on on the the course link list. Um, but essentially, this paper explored some different configurations of the BAM diagram and how they correspond to the ability to fit a good niche model or not. And um, what what we showed was that if M, the mobility circle in the BAM diagram, is the principal constraint rather than A, which is the abiotic conditions, then very frequently you get to a situation where you cannot perceive the limits of the ecological niche. 
And as a result of that, you can't characterize the ecological niche. Um, and so we call those Wallacean species in homage to Alfred Russell Wallace. And I think it's a pretty clear um, conclusion that Wallacean species do not lend themselves to characterizing all of the limits of the niche. And so if you were, if you were looking at a bunch of species that you might want to uh, examine with these tools, um, a species where its distribution essentially abuts major barriers like, like coastlines and rivers or very abrupt mountain ranges, many times those will, spe those will be species that are not very amenable to fitting a good niche model. Um, and that's why when I look out over the literature, you know, obvious, and I've, I've done some of these papers where you say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do climate change projections for all of the birds of Mexico or all of the birds of North America or something like that. Well, some of those species will be really apt and appropriate and, and amenable to, to uh, climate change projections, and others definitely will not. And so we should, um, we should treat them appropriately. And I, I personally now think that we just should not be doing these big survey uh, papers where we look across tons of species, because depending on the region, a lot of those will be species that are not very good uh, and should not be um, subjected to these projections. Uh, it's interesting your comment, Tom, because uh, we have, have done that many times to model like in mass thousands of species. And in, in the past of the years, we have learned that many things that we did in the past, we wouldn't do it in the same way now, I think. Very certain. I mean, this has been a, um, you know, for Enrique and me, it's been a 20 year plus endeavor. Um, and we've learned tons of uh, lessons along the way. And so, um, Definitely, some of the things that we did years ago were were pretty stupid, but you know they're also the lessons you learn along the way, right? Yeah. Ladies, any any questions you'd like to take on? Any comments? Uh, we we were just um, uh, like to say hi uh, to mm. everybody in the course, of course, and and to begin to participate a little bit in this dynamic of um, answering questions and see what is what what are the, the relevant questions for next sessions, so that we can that the, that we can uh, direction our our courses towards the main uh, concerns that the students have. So for now, I am, I am appalled by the number of questions every week. It's, it's, been, uh, <laughs> it's been hard. I think it's been harder for you guys. I, uh, <laughs> I feel bad for the students because not every one of their questions gets, um, gets answered. Yes, uh, yeah. so what I like to do is just take, take you know, 15, 20 minutes and scan through. If I see the same question a bunch of times, then that's one that should be answered. Mm -hmm. uh, and also if I see one that is particularly kind of on point, I try to answer that one. Uh, but no, we just, we, it is a huge number of questions. Yes. Yes. It has been, I'll, I'll take one on right now because it's directed to me. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, any, again, you guys jump in whenever you have anything to say. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, feel free to scroll through the questions and pick out ones that you're interested in. Uh, but here's one, it's on line 751. Uh, this question is to Dr. Peterson. That's town, by the way. 
Um, do you agree with Dr. Martinez Mayer? That's Enrique, by the way. By the way. Most of the SDM transferred to future time are unuseful because of the high degree of uncertainty. If yes, why are so many recent publications that include this approach? Enrique responded, be careful, I did not say they're useless. I said that many people get overexcited with the results and think that the results are the truth. Uh, projections to future scenarios are very useful if they're interpreted correctly, which includes taking into account the degree of uncertainty that they hold. Um, I think I would be more pessimistic than Enrique, which is to say every exploration that a bunch of labs have done point to a huge amount of uncertainty. There's a very early one that Enrique was part of that showed just immense algorithm to algorithm variation and maybe GCM to GCM variation in the severity of the, of the climate change implications. Um, we did a more recent thing that I'll, I'll put online. I'll try to put both of them online um, where we showed that the GCM was one of the biggest um, factors in generating variation in model outputs. You know, if you think about these things, what could generate um, differences in the outcome of these models? Well, we have the GCMs, we have the RCPs, we have probably some replicate resampling of our data, we have algorithms, right? All these things are factors. We'd ideally like to see them home in on one truth right, which is the future distribution of the species. But what we see commonly, and I've now looked at a bunch of species, what we see commonly is that the big contributing factors to the variation are things like algorithm and GCM. So what are the algorithms? They're different ways of estimating the niche, but it's the same niche that's being estimated. So hopefully the algorithms would all home in on the same truth. And what are GCMs? They're different simulations of global climate. And when they are tuned to future greenhouse gas concentrations, well, we hope that they would zoom in on or home in on the same future climate scenarios. The only element that really ought to make a big difference is the RCPs, because that is a high greenhouse gas emissions world versus a low greenhouse gas emissions world. And so I would love to see RCPs emerge as kind of the major factor in generating variation in these model outputs. And that a high RCP should show more extreme results, and a low RCP should show less extreme results. And guess what? When we do these things, that's not what we see. In fact, I think I can get to it pretty quickly. Um, I thought I could get to it pretty quickly. Um, essentially, what we see frequently is that, that the GCMs are the big one in generating um, in generating variation in these results. Here's the paper. I'll put this online for you all. Um, you know, major challenges, oops, sorry. Major challenges for correlational ecological niche model projections to future climate conditions. And there's one figure in here that I want you to see. There it is. So in this case, we looked at four different independent factors that could generate model-to-model -model variation. Replicate resampling of the occurrence data, which should not affect our estimate of the niche other than generating some variation. RCPs, GCMs, and then the parameters of the Maxent model that were chosen in a model selection procedure. The vertical axis is the percent of variation um, in the output that's generated. 
And what I want you to notice is that the biggest factor by far is the parameters, right? Is it the regularization multiplier of 1.2 versus 1.4? So this is really, really scary because what it says is something that just a few years ago we didn't even pay attention to is generating fourfold more variation from model to model than the RCPs, which are real differences in greenhouse gas emissions. So I think I would agree with Enrique that um, a lot of those future transfers of SDMs or ENMs, I would call it an ENM, are not useful. I, I want to make a point here, Tom. Uh, even if we have the perfect algorithm that, that we don't, even if there is, is some consensus on, on what is the futures or the future scenarios will be, like reduce the extremes, for example, whatever. And even if, if the uncertainty about uh, GCMs can be reduced. Uh, my, my whole point is that ecological niche models cannot predict the future because they don't take into account how species will behave. We, we, we are not, uh, in a way we are not modeling, uh, well, not in a way, we are not modeling the process of the response of species to climate change. So uh, we, we are not taking into account behavioral strategies of species or physiological uh, strategies of species to deal with climate, climatic variation that actually occurs. We were, for example, species hibernate or species uh, shift their, their phenology depending on, on, on climatic conditions. And those kind of things are not incorporated in this approach. So my main point here is that we understand what the limitations are and, and don't, don't get overexcited on, on, the, on the potentialities because such pot potentialities are, are uh, dangerous to believe in. Yeah, that, that's a very, very good point. Um, in fact, the climatologists would say that the yep. GCM outputs are not predictions. They are just scenarios. They are just scenarios, that's right. If the world behaves the way our simulation assumes that it behaves, then what will the climates of the world look like if the greenhouse gas concentrations are this, this, and this? That is not a prediction. It's a scenario. Mm -hmm. And what we have with niche models and projections to future climates are scenarios built on top of scenarios. Uncertainty so, built on top of, of uncertainty. Also, yes. Uh, whatever uncertainty there is in the GCM, the uncertainty in our niche models compounds that uncertainty. That's right. And we don't know how, how this uncertainty and error is, is uh, transmitted from one step to the next. We don't, we don't know. Um, later in the course, we'll be talking about ensemble models um, and our own Gengping Zhu, who spoke this week. Uh, Gengping has done some really nice work with what does it mean to use ensemble models um, as an approach to dealing with that model-to-model -model variation. Interesting and, and challenging work. Essentially, it, it, it suggests that it might not be the, the best approach. Um, Anyhow, I think that our field would do very well to approach these models with a lot more caution and kind of realism about what it is. It's not a prediction. It's only a what if. And so if we, if we think about them and use them appropriately, they'll be more powerful scientifically. Uh, it's it's more an intellectual uh, 
exercise that than a mechanical exercise uh, projecting or building ecological niche models we, we need to think very very carefully what we are doing we we need to know very well our our data and our studied region to understand or, or to to have a, a criterion to to say if a model despite the the good numbers that could could we get from from validation metrics it's making sense or not and this is something that that it's subjective in in a way but uh it's something that our own expertise ca can judge and there is uh, there is no perfect way to validate models so we we have to rely in some in some way in our uh, knowledge about the, the species and, and and what we are doing yeah. well there's there's a common question that is appearing here that is related a little bit but uh, with this uh, uncertainty that is the fact that we also have analog and non-analog uh, scenarios like uh, parts of the environmental space that may have not been uh, present in the in, in, so far so so uh, I have been, I have seen this this uh, question a little bit uh, in the in the in the list, and uh, we were remembering the the works of um, Williams in two thousand and seven. They 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 discuss non-analog communities and they also discuss non-analog climates. So so we have to remember that every time that we are uh, dealing with potential climate change or potential change anyway. Um, we also have a lot of unknowns that not not yet uh, appear in the in these spaces. So, um, how are we going to to clamp or not the variables? How are we going to to try to fit these models? Is is a, a key part that I think it's still under discussion. So so uh, we saw a little bit of uh, questions about that. We just wanted to to say that uh, the non-analogous uh, definition is. Uh, combinations of extant things that do not haven't occurred uh, so far together if we are thinking about uh, individualistic responses of climate to environmental changes um, we, ha we may have combinations that have other consequences that are not yet known so, so uh, maybe if you guys uh, want to expand a little bit on that non-analog pa non part it would be. That's a great point. Um, that's yet another kind of dimension of uncertainty in these projections. We're going to yeah. talk about that a fair amount later in the course. Um, this is, I, I never know whether to put the applications part at the beginning or the end of the course. Um, you know, the, the nice thing is that we can motivate and illustrate in advance. And the bad thing is, is that we wake up a whole bunch of questions that we're going to get to later on. Um, but yeah, I mean, non-analog conditions are a huge component of generating that uncertainty because our algorithms don't have any information about those non-analog conditions. Yes. Let's yeah. look at a question on line 755. So this is referring to Geng Ping's uh, presentation. It says, about invasive species applications, how do I know which model is the correct one after I've tried three different models? Aha. <laughs> no? um, well, anyway. yeah. <laughs> you know, if I had the answer to that question, <laughs> uh, no, seriously, what, what this leads us to is one point, which is that sometimes you don't know what's the correct model. Um, one thing that you can do is to set up tests of your model that mimic what you are trying to learn. So let's imagine we have an invasive species that is everywhere in the world except South America. And we're interested in what is its potential in South America. Well, in that case, we can very easily say, well, let's leave out North America and see how a model based on the remaining continents can, how well the, that model could predict North America. 
or let's leave out Africa, or let's leave out Australia. Or if we don't have the multiple continents, we could leave out sections even of the native range. But we could ask how well do, do your three different models, um, how well do they anticipate other sectors of the distribution of the species? With that information, we have at least at least an, a, a beginning of a view of which, uh, which of our models does that spatial transfer better, okay? That's not a perfect answer because all of these things that we've just mentioned, uh, you know, things like the, the non-analog conditions, they all enter into this. But at the very least, you could set up some initial tests that give you some degree of, of an answer as to which, um, which model might be doing a better job. That's a, a, a very good point, Tom, because this also applies for, for climate change studies. It, it, it's a common practice that you, you can use, for example, several GCMs for one scenario. And then you ensemble those uh, resulting models. And uh, to me, it's also a mistake to think that uh, ensemble will, will resolve the problems because uh, just, uh, we don't know what, what uh, projections are better in the first place. So it, it can easily happen that all of them are wrong because calibration, calibration is wrong. So uh, this is not going to, ensemble is not going to solve this problem. So it, I, I agree totally with you that, I totally agree with you that uh, we need to have some sort of validation to, to know if, if projections even to another area like in this case of invasive species or to a different time Hola Jorge and are are uh, sensible make sense and uh, that's why I, I suggested that in in an ideal uh, scenario to do field work and to see if in those areas where the, the model is predicting that the species is going to, to disappear, for example, or conditions for the species will disappear, if there is something in the population that we, that we can measure, that, it's, uh, that can say us if that's the direction it's taking. There's a, can I, do you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay. There's another thing regarding uh, invasive species that uh, it, it doesn't apply only to invasive species, but also to any application in, in ENM and SEM. That is uh, the, the question, because it's so different to, to evaluate models for invasions that are already happening or that did already happen. So you might, uh, you might have already the data regarding the new invaded areas and what changed between the native ranges and the invaded ranges so you can maybe have, a, have an idea of what's going on later but sometimes you are just wanting to see if something that was that wasn't introduced already uh, could be an invasive so the the amount of the amount of um, of uh, you allow the model to be more generous if you are if you are trying to avoid a potential uh, invade, invasive species to appear. You have to be more careful maybe, because it's not only the, the fact that uh, there's a, a large a core uh, adequate area that is going to be invaded, but you, you, you cannot predict what is going to happen to, to the species. So you might want to be a little bit more generous and, and, and a little bit uh, to widen your expectations to be careful because Invasion, invasion in the field might lead to some enemy release uh, or some changes that you cannot expect. So it's very different to be applying these kind of tools to, to avoid or to check for potential areas that are 
pretty risky. If they were invaded, it would be a, a loss. Or to, to see, to understand uh, extant invasions. If, if, if we are invaded, if we are studying invasions that are already happening, you, you have more tools, you have better data. But you also can be a little bit more restrictive and a little bit more precise with your model. So, so, so the application of why are you going to do this is absolutely key to how are you going to deal with it, I think. Town, now that Jorge is here, there is a question that I really would like him to answer. It's, uh, I, I, I cannot find it, but uh, it said, but uh, yeah, I introduced the concept of Elton Eltonian noise, uh -huh. but I didn't explain it uh, thor thoroughly. So, Jorge. Town and I in invented that concept in order to satisfy ourselves that we could ignore biotic <laughs> interactions safely. So, but I'm going to be serious and not fastidious about it. Uh, the idea is that we know that interactions at, a at small scales are really important because we see predators eating their prey and um, herbivores eating the plants and parasites, uh, parasites uh, killing parts of a population, things like that. So we know that they, they matter at certain scales. What we suspect is that when you coarsen the scale of your study, say from a few hectares or maybe a few, a few hectares to, to many square kilometers or tens of square kilometers, then the importance of interactions is uh, diminishes. Uh, probably because you are averaging, uh, maybe the interaction is very strong inside the forest but not outside the forest. And if you increase the scale, you have both conditions, both habitats, or maybe at larger scales, there are other species that also interfere with the, with the dynamics and uh, all sorts of things. So at coarse scales, maybe interactions are basically noise in the in random uh, effects on, on, on these niche models that we do. It, it is, um, this Eltonian noise hypothesis is the hypothesis we, we came um, about in order to explain the fact that you could predict so much using niche modeling without information about the interactors. And since, since niche modeling and, and the distributions based on niches actually work and we have good data to show that they predict well, what is going on with interactions? Because all the ecologists in, in, in the group, we were raised to think that interactions matter a lot. So what happens? And our, our Eltonian noise hypothesis, it, the answer is it is a matter of scale. At different scales, interactions matter more than at other scales. That one, I don't know if that's... Yeah, you're perfectly correct that, that it's mostly a matter of scale. And then there are gonna be some cases, some cases where sure, biotic interactions matter. And what we, were, what we were trying to do with the Eltonian noise idea was to provoke people, to stimulate people to ask those questions. Because what had always been in the literature were studies of biotic interactions at those micro scales because those are the scales where it's feasible to do those tests. You know, you, you exclude an herbivore from this area and the plants go nuts. Or you exclude a one mouse and the, the population of another mouse goes way up. You can't do those, those experiments even on the scale of a square kilometer. And we're talking about Thousands. Of yeah, we're talking about very coarse things. You know, if you use a, a, a 10 minute um, climate coverage, then that's 17 by 17 kilometers of area. And there's no way you can do an experiment even for one pixel, much less hundreds of pixels. And so I think I'm kind of happy that we 
toss that idea out because now if you, if you look in Google Scholar at Eltonian noise hypothesis or Eltonian noise, you see a few dozen papers that have taken very different and diverse ways of asking that question or addressing that question, but they're asking that question. Yeah. And um, there are, as Town says, there are several published papers already testing in the field uh, the hypothesis. And without being formal at all, say probably a little bit more than half of those students uh, support the idea of the Eltonian noise hypothesis, and maybe a little bit less than half reject it. So it's, it's something still in the air, and it's going to be very interesting to have more information about it. So here, this is just to illustrate the point, but here's Eltonian noise hypothesis. 391. 106, 181 hits that use the, that three word phrase. And as I said, there've been lots of different kinds of tests. Uh, we'll talk about some of these later on, but essentially what what's a common approach to this question is you build models with information about another species and you build the same models without the information on the other species and you ask if the information about the other species made your models better in some sense and we could quibble about what better means but the point is very simply that that people are asking those questions and i think that's that was what we were after yes that's satisfactory enrique yes jorgito thank you <laughs> <laughs> here are a couple of questions regarding uh, definition of of terms and uh, it's a uh, line 566 during the third, the third week uh, classes, I heard uh, more than once some concepts so, such as transferability and non-analog climates. Andrea and Sarah already talked about uh, non-analog climates. But transferability is the same as projection, as projecting in each model into different uh, scenarios. That's what, what we mean. Uh, when we say we transfer a model, we project the model to a different scenario. Yeah. Be a little bit careful with using the term projection because that has some pretty precise and different meanings in mathematics. Mm -hmm. And so a more neutral term is transfer. The... Yeah, and, we, and we have to remember that <clears throat> there's a trade-off between being transferable and uh, the fitting. If sometimes if the fitting is too good, you just won't be able to transfer the, the model because you are uh, setting your model to exactly very closely to the occurrence point. So everybody, when, when everybody is talking about transferability, is a little bit uh, related also with the, the problem of overfitting uh, because you can't have both. That's a huge, huge problem. A very good point. Um, if you look at the, the 2006 ecography paper by Elith and colleagues, and Jorge and I were amongst them. Enrique, were you on that one? No. I'm no? Uh, but if you look at that paper, which has been cited thousands of times, it's a paper about fitting models and predicting the distribution on the same range. Mm -hmm. okay. And so the main conclusion about that paper was complex models are better. Mm -hmm. But that's a very, very different question than what's the best model to transfer mm -hmm. to another time, to that's another right. place, whatever. And yet that paper has been cited as the justification for using you know, Maxent and a few other uh, algorithms as the best. But in reality, that definition of best was 
used for an interpolation, essentially a, a, an internal prediction. And so it really is a, an, an overly simplistic and in fact incorrect view of the literature to cite that paper as a uh, as a a reason to use let's say maxent for your future climate prediction and also for the discarding of other algorithms because not only were uh, some of the algorithms well ranked so they they became more used but some others were discarded as uh, this is the, the the example for a bad algorithm and it depends on the on the application we when when we use some modeling sometimes uh, simpler algorithms are, are doing exactly uh, a quite good job with having low emissions and, uh, and uh, not necessarily being uh, just plain wrong, plain bad. We have seen that. Yeah, uh, in fact, later in the course, we're gonna see some level of assertion that we ought to toss out all of these complex machine learning models, algorithms, you just use nice convex shapes like ellipsoids. Mm -hmm. We're going to come back to that point at a couple, a couple points in the, in this course, and it's a challenging one. I mean, we all love Maxent, and everybody, you know, just try to publish a paper on niche modeling without Maxent. Max yeah. Ooh, the reviewers are going to say. Oh, that's good, but where's the Maxent model? They use it's like the the rod against everything is being measured. Yes. The the, the standard. That's right. We'll, again, we'll come back to a lot of these questions later on in the course, but uh, I think it's really good that you bring this up because mm -hmm. because we need to be thinking right now or the, the, the participants need to be thinking right now that there's not one easy answer. Uh, we'll read a paper called No Silver Bullets in Ecological Niche Modeling later on. Uh, but there is no easy, simple answer. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. yeah, and I think that um, in several questions we see um, questions that are actually wanting an easy answer and but people are actually asking about concepts and there's no and we need to think about the theory and your goals and your hypothesis and why you're doing the modeling and and then you use the tools to decide which model or which technique you will use but there are a lot of misconceptions about concepts and tools so i think that this the structure of the course is very good in like right now we are thinking about theory and concepts and later on we will be more thinking more about the tools and then at the end we hope that we can actually relate all of that and make better decisions that's a very good point um just to give an illustration, in the when we talk about an ecological niche, it's something that's in environmental space, and we define it as the set of conditions where our species could maintain populations. We don't define it as the set of conditions where our species will have populations, just could have populations. But if you go down through the set of methodological decisions that we're going to make along the way, all of a sudden you're going to see, oh, how do I threshold a model? And you're going to see very, very commonly that the decisions that people make as far as thresholding will include both omission error as something you want to minimize, but also commission error. And that sounds fine. I'm going to minimize overall error in choosing my threshold. But guess what? Commission error is that extra area where our species maybe could maintain populations, but doesn't. And so that's an example of how our concepts, 
like the idea of niche maps on the potential distribution, our concepts fail to guide our methodology. And there are a thousand other examples of where we have made that mistake and others have made those mistakes. Yep. And so we really need to kind of take Sarah's comment to heart. Have the concepts, think about the concepts deeply and let them guide your decisions about what methodology you should be using. Yeah. I want to take on 567 question. Okay, this is gonna be the last question because I've got to run in just a moment. I have another course to teach actually. Okay. Uh, it, it, he or she says, uh, he, he, he shown some mistaken conclusions of papers working with species and climate change. So what type of conclusion this kind of modeling is able to provide? It's a, it's a very interesting question. Well, I, I, I think that the most that we can get from, from niche models in projections to future scenarios is trends. It's general trends of, of uh, or, or direction of, of change or and magnitude of change in the potential distribution of species. What I think we cannot say from these models right now is when, in what year, for example, and where, in what pixel, the species is going to disappear or where we should set a new uh, protected area for uh, preventing the, the future of, of such species. I think that kind of, of uh, fine uh, results we are not able to get with, with these tools in the state they are now. And in the same question, he, he, this person says, uh, in a few words, what's the difference between RCPs and GCMs? RCPs are uh, emission scenarios. How, how much uh, carbon, dioxide and the other greenhouse gases will will accumulate in the atmosphere and uh, that will produce uh, a warming a warming effect and gcms are uh, models that given those uh, given that a warming effect how climate is going to change what other parameters of, of climate like like precipitation winds uh, etc etc which is to say each gcm could be tuned to the conditions in any number of RCPs. Yes. And every RCP can have several GCMs. Yeah. And RCPs have changed. The, the nomenclature about RCPs has been changing. So there are lots of paper where it's still uh, A, A2, B1, B2. So, so the business as usual or intensive. So sometimes when we read papers about that, uh, since the since the terms have been changing, now the now this now the term is RCP, but ten years ago it was uh, climate change scenario. Like I I, I don't even remember right. yeah. something like that. So so it has been changing. We we already have uh, RCPs from twenty years ago that could be tested today and maybe. Uh, and notice. But, RCP is representative concentration pathways. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. explicitly a scenario. It's representative. It's, it's representative. There are more than 1,200 uh, uh, scenario, emission scenarios. More than 1,200. Yeah. Okay, everybody. I'm afraid I have to go. Okay. And so that ends this party. Um, Enrique, Andrea, Sara, and Jorge, thank you very much. And we'll be up next week with an, oops, I hate it when that happens. Um, we'll have another set of, of uh, Abby. Fox. We will be hearing Abby. about. Ven para que te salude. Let's see. We have um, large scale conservation planning, sorry, systematic conservation planning, large-scale conservation and recovery projects, and public health applications. Hola, Abby. Estás en el, en el mundo. Te está viendo el mundo. Ah, hola. <laughs> A thousand people around the world are going to see, see you say hi.
Hi. <laughs> nice okay. to see you guys. I'm afraid I have to go. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you next time. Bye-bye. Adios. Adios. Ciao. Pórtense bien. Siempre. Nos bien.